Today, we get to talk with John Rulin of the Rulin Group. His company is trusted by all of these top leaders of fast growing companies like Chicago Cubs, San Antonio Spurs, Morgan Stanley, DR Horton, and a whole bunch more. He develops relationships and gifting strategies for these companies. And we'll get into exactly what that means later in the episode. But let me tell you that everything he's talking about today works like all caps, it works. Whether it's a handwritten note or a small thoughtful token of gratitude or even a super fancy expensive gift, being generous with your gratitude, especially in business, it works always. John wrote this book called Giftology, which has been featured in media outlets like Forbes magazine. And the book is featured with all these case studies, stories, and ideas for how to give better gifts and as a result, build better relationships both in and out of business. John's got some great advice to us today and a super cool download with a list of the top gifts to avoid giving, which you can download right now by going to giftologybook.com forward slash Emily. But that PDF download will make a lot more sense when you hear some of John's story and my own experience in applying his ideas to my life. You're listening to Bare Naked Bravery, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Emily Ann Peterson. As a singer-songwriter, author, teaching artist, and creative entrepreneur, I encounter some really fascinating stories. I'm on a mission to reveal the depth and width of bravery and its benefits to creatives like yourself. More than ever today, our world needs bravery, unique bravery, from everyone. This is the place where you find it. There is no script or censorship today because that's how these facets of bare naked bravery are in real life. So if you're listening with little ears nearby, please know that some episodes may contain mature language and subject matter. One of the easiest ways you can share bravery with the world is to send this episode to a friend or two. Send them an email, text, or tweet. Tag them in one of my Instagram posts. My handle is Emily Ann Pete. Or leave us a review on iTunes. It takes seconds and can be done from your phone right now. Again, we need more bravery in the world. So let's be brave together. Are you ready for some bare naked bravery? I am ready. I think so. <laughs> it's a little it's a little nerve-wracking sometimes, that's for sure. So today we have John Rulin with us and he wrote the book Giftology which I have been peace reading over the last several weeks and have been really enjoying Um, and I have to tell you John I as I was reading it I was thinking oh this interview is coming up in three weeks I think I have enough time to try some of this stuff out and so I did in several different circumstances and it, all of it worked out really, really well, and I really love the whole premise behind it. So for those of us who haven't read the book, can you give us a little like synopsis over why you wrote it and what it's supposed to do for us? Yeah, yeah. So I've wanted to write it for a long time. I tried to write it for like five years and just like would get frustrated, crash and burn. And frankly, one of the best things that I did was I started to get on podcasts and started to talk things out and that get asked new questions. And that kind of spurred some of the creative angles and, and elements. So I'm actually pretty grateful for being able to share the message even beforehand, because a lot of what ended up in the book started out as a, as a podcast interview. But I'd say that the core of why we wrote the book is we own a gift strategy and logistics company and we work with companies from, you know, small startups to the Chicago Cubs and everywhere in between. And everybody, all these leaders say that relationships matter. Like that, that's their most important asset, relationships, relationships. And then their actions are not congruent with their words. And so we were like, gosh, if, even if we can't help somebody, it'd be nice if there was something out there that would inspire people to treat their relationships and like they matter and actually do it tangibly and, and consistently and not once a year at the holidays. And so the core of the book is really like our playbook of how we've built relationships 
with some of the most powerful people and creative people and some of the biggest pro sports teams on the planet as being a farm boy from Ohio. So I didn't grow up with the right relationships and the right, in the right circles. And so I've been eating my own dog food for 17 years. And finally we put it in playbook form so people could take it and run with it. And, and it's having a lot of impact. So just so you guys know, gift strategy, give us an example of like what you guys did with the Cubs, for instance. Yeah. So the Cubs, the people are like, how are you doing like the gifts for the players? And it's like, no, it's on the business side. Like the reason they can afford to play it, pay a player $30 million is because they have sponsors and suites and people that are paying a lot of money to either advertise or partner with the Cubs. And so in their case, they have like 400 key relationships. Could be the Wrigley family, could be, you know, the Pepsi, all those kind of companies are paying a lot of money to have suites or sponsor. And so you can't give them a cheap bottle of wine or bottle of chocolate or crap, like, which is what most people do. They're like, I don't know what to do. So we'll just send something. So they came to us and said, Hey, we have, we're redoing Wrigley Field, this iconic structure, one of the most iconic really structures in the world, especially in sports. And they said, we're taking the locker room wood out. And we have this old wood that is pretty beaten up, but we don't want to make a plaque out of it. We want to do something cool and unique with it. Do you have any ideas? And I've been calling on them for seven years wanting to get their business. And so I said, well, these are impossible to impress people. Let's make, you know, everybody's into audio and tech stuff, but let's make it unique. And so we took the wood that was one of a kind wood and we reformed it into Bluetooth speakers and numbered them. And so now everybody, these 400 people have a individual piece of Wrigley field on their desk or at their home that is now producing this amazing audio and the people freaked. Even people that are worth millions or even billions of dollars were like, I have a piece of Wrigley Field on my desk. And it's not just a chunk of wood. It's actually, there's a practical, unique use for it. And, and so if you go to rulinggroup.com, that's one of our featured case studies is showing off these speakers. Because even the audio company, Listen, LSTN is a real creative boutique company. They're like, John, we want to be a part of the project, but we don't think this wood is usable. And so we had to find our own creative manufacturer that we ended up buying the company because they did such an amazing job on some of these kind of projects with us. But that, that's, people come to us when they have really a lot, lots of important relationships that they want to appreciate and show gratitude and they don't want to, you know, send them some swag bag or schlep them some like box of chocolates. So one of the things that I really loved <laughs> about your book was the, the very apt comment that, a gift is not a t-shirt with your logo on it or anything with your own logo on it. It's usually, if you're going to put a logo of anything on it, it's that person's logo, the receiver's logo or their monogram. And I'm fully behind that, fully behind that. (laughs) Because I always hate it when somebody gives you like a really cool, so for instance, some of these music conferences or music industry things, you know, you get these thumb drives with really cool things and you can use the, you can take the content in the thumb drive off and keep using the thumb drive. But now you're like stuck with like somebody else's logo and it's cool to be reminded of those things. But if you have no, I don't know, it's just not as cool. No. Well, if you think about it, like you, people do things in business, they'd never do in a personal situation. Like you'd never go to somebody's wedding and get this beautiful Tiffany's vase for the couple and engrave compliments of Emily Peterson on it. Like that'd be the cheesiest thing in the world. But in business, we call that marketing and branding and advertising. And that's BS because the logo that you're putting on there does not add value to the product. It takes value away. And so the Cubs can get away with it because people pay a lot of money to have the Cubs logo on something. But unless you're a part of like this special club like secret underground society where having like the logo on it means something. It's like a brother or sisterhood. Then, you know, if you're X, Y, Z, nobody wants Sony on their t-shirt. Like nobody wants, unless you work for Sony, maybe if you're Sony CEO, but even he, I bet you doesn't wear Sony t-shirts. Like he wears Prada or something. It's, and, and if you look at the, the high end brands, even they're subtle in their branding and their brand actually means something. Mm-hmm. And so if you're XYZ manufacturer or, or, you know, ABC accounting firm, like it's, it's horrible. It's like the unclassiest thing on the planet, but that's what every marketing and branding book tells you is, well, you're going to spend all that money on that. You better get your, what's interesting is 
people have a negative thought every time they see the logo and they're, they're 10 times less likely to actually use it and keep it when it's branded with somebody's cheesy logo. If you personalize it and you give something world class, they're likely to use it. And I tell people, if I give you a Rolex, would I have to put my logo on it for you to remind, be reminded of where it came from? And I'm like, no, I'd never forget where the Rolex came from. I'm like, exactly. Like if you give a Rolex quality to your relationships, they'll, they remember subconsciously where it came from. You don't have to put your logo on it, put their name on it and, and call it a day. It's really good advice. <laughs> it's really good advice. It's really good advice. Okay. So before we have done, I told you that I had done my own experiments with this in the last couple yeah, weeks. Yeah. Tell me, give, give me, give me the yeah. goods. So I'm part of a group of other podcasters and we all get together every week and talk about podcasting and just our general, like who we're getting on guests and we're just like keeping each other accountable. Yeah. And one of these podcasters, she got a re- an offer she couldn't refuse to work at a really cool magazine out in LA and which meant that she wasn't going to be part of our group anymore. And yeah. I was like, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to to try this out. And so I asked the other group members if it was all right if we like went in on a gift. Yes. But they were all all about it. And then I asked a fellow Instagram buddy who makes these awesome pieces of jewelry. And I asked her if she'd be willing to customize a piece of jewelry and like put a put a phrase on the bracelet that we all agree, all of us group members agreed on. Yeah. She was off. She was like totally gung ho for it. And then even printed out like a really sweet note, like with really great, uh, it was just really well done. The packaging was awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think what was really cool was that my Instagram Etsy friend loved the fact that it was a secret, like, she loved yeah she loved the fact that it was a secret surprise like project um and so it it just pulled it was totally successful totally successful and i was really i was in my head i was thinking wow this first of all didn't cost me much in time or in dollars it didn't cost me much but it made an absolutely awesome impact on everyone involved like even the people who other people who are giving the gift yeah and it was just a fun little little thing fun little thing yeah well there's a ripple effect i mean who totally. knows when, when that relationship that you guys will cross paths again and time it's just such a it's such a powerful thing it's such a simple concept and you know the handwritten note being beautifully done and the packaging mattering and the personalization and the quality and it being you know, custom made for somebody, all those little things, like it's, it's easier to order something from Amazon and call it a day, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't make people feel special. And, and your impact is, is so significantly less. So kudos to you for taking it and running with it. Yeah, it was fun. I, I, you know, there is a couple things that I was reading in, in the book where I was thinking, gosh, you know, that might come across a little bit creepy though. Like, (laughs) So in that scenario, in this scenario with my podcast friends, it worked out really well because we all knew each other already. We already had a relationship that was built. But in some of your work and in some of your case studies, you're giving gifts to people who you haven't really met met before. (laughs) Yeah. Sounds a little nutty, huh? Yeah, it sounds nutty. (laughs) Yeah. Well, here's here's what I like in it, Sue. If you sit down, let's say somebody, you're meeting somebody for the first time and when you sit down with them in a business scenario and all of a sudden they start rattling off like, hey, I I looked into your background and I saw that you're a huge music person and hey, I really love the lyrics of this blah, blah, blah song that most people don't even know that you wrote. And they start, they're like, all of a sudden you feel like you're like the president of the United States. Like somebody's like took enough interest in you to do like an entire background sweep on you as a person that makes you feel important and cared about and VIP and all these things. And I think that what we do with gifting is we do the same kinds of things where we do our research. And when we send a gift to somebody, especially in business, the other person, now if it's, if you did that for your first date, that probably wouldn't work out maybe as well. Um, (laughs) 
But in business, it shows an attention to detail. It shows an effort and a persistence and a follow through and a, all of these different things. And so do you sometimes creep people out? Yeah, probably one out of a hundred times people are like, you know, what, for, and, and sometimes it's because of what you did. Sometimes it's because of what's going on in their life. Divorce, their company's being investigated for fraud. I mean, you name it, we've dealt with it. But in general, when you take the extra time to be creative and over the top with people, most of the time people are, they kind of feel honored. And at least they're intrigued enough to say, wow, this person stands out, they're memorable, they're creative enough, they're worth a five minute phone call or a 10 minute meeting or whatever you're looking for. And that's so, to us, the risk is worth the reward. And even if it was one out of 10 people that I pissed off, I'll take the nine that are blown away and the one that is going to be cranky no matter what, who cares? Like people get a little too worked up over the one squeaky wheel versus the other nine that are just like eating it up. And so, so that's, that's kind of how we view it. Do you have any good rejection stories? Oh, for sure. Well, I have, I won't say the university name, but we're targeting university, like the kind of their endowment and their kind of gift, their high level gifting, their high level giving department and we sent off like seven different and you know my background being in cutlery and knives and I like things that are practical and utilitarian useful we sent off like you seven. side side note you'd probably really I don't, you might already know him Nick Conadera was on our podcast several episodes oh, ago yeah oh I know Nick really well he yeah was just, he was just texting with me about the Miracle Morning movie uh-huh uh, which he's working on which Hal Elrod's like one of my best friends totally uh, so, so um yeah Nick uh, came on and talked about his whole film film process. This is really great. It's awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's done like the, the sharp movie. It's a, it's oh, yeah. a whole Cutco story. And I mean, he sold Cutco and a lot of what he does now is his success is a direct result of the sales skills and, you know, overcoming objections that he learned mm-hmm. selling Cutco. So, mm-hmm. so in this case, I sent off like seven different knife sets that were personalized to the university, their logo, their name, da, 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 spouse's name. And I didn't know that they were being investigated for fraud. Like and somebody was like improper, all these things like in the tens of millions of dollars. And so all the gifts got rejected and sent right back to my door. So it was like $1,500 worth of gifts that are permanently engraved with all this other stuff. So that happens from time to time. I mean, I've had times where people were targeting high level executives and they get a note back from the executive saying, this would have been really good five years ago when I was still married to XYZ. I'm now married to Susie and my wife Susie would love these gifts if you'd start engraving her name on these knives or these leather bags or whatever it was. And so they're horrified. They gave me the wrong information. They gave my team. They didn't know that they were remarried. And what I tell them is they took the time to reach out to you and engage you in a conversation and say, well, we actually would probably take a meeting if you would start, you know, so the gifts were appreciated enough to get a response, which is really all you're looking for. And they're actually being pretty pleasant relative to engraving an ex-wife's name on whatever the item is. And so there's always a silver lining. And so oftentimes people, they freak out. In this case, this one guy, just, he was like mortified. And I'm like, dude, this is, a, this is a Fortune 50 company COO that just responded to you. You should be doing like a happy dance. And what we did was, we took the, it was a knife set. It was like a $700 knife set. We ended up sending him a $2,100 knife set. So we tripled the value of the gift. So the next gift he got was like, we actually, our goal is when there's a mistake, we, we get people to reach out and say, we're so glad you screwed up because what we ended up with was like three times nicer than what we would have otherwise. Whereas most people freak out and they shut down and they go into like caveman mode and go in their cave. I'm like, okay, we screwed up. But our fault, client's fault, whoever, what can we do to make this a, like a double down or triple down and make this a positive? And you can't always save it, but oftentimes you can when you're willing to, to get creative and, and put your money where your mouth is. So my, just a little background on me, my aunt owned or was a partner in a really big marketing agency here in Atlanta. She's now retired and wants to have nothing to do with marketing. Yep. <laughs> and and I, although both she and I were watching the Super Bowl and both of us were telling our male relatives to, shh, it's the commercials. Yeah, that's the most <laughs> um, important part. Oh yeah, exactly. 
anyway, so I was asking her about, you know, hey, you ran this agency. Were you the recipient of some of these kinds of gifts? What are some of your experiences in this? And she was like, oh my gosh, we got all sorts of gifts. And for the most part, especially if the gifts were coming from media outlets, they would have to reject the gift just out of not conflict of interest or whatever conflict of interest, not wanting to partake in payola, all of that kind of stuff. And so as someone who might be receiving gifts or might be receiving attention or shout outs or any other sort of creative congratulations, how do you navigate that? Yeah. How do you create your own set of boundaries for when you reject the gift or when it's not okay to give a gift or whatever. Yeah. So we don't encourage gifting during like RFP processes or whatever else. Like that's a yeah, request for a proposal. So we're, we, there are times when a gifting is inappropriate. If it's Walmart and you can't even take somebody out for a cup of coffee or give them a pen, then take them off the list. But if somebody is able to accept a, a dinner out, a ball game tickets, a uh, round of golf, like normal entertaining things in business, we say that you know, the rule of thumb for us is whatever those would cost. Most of the time, you know, a nice dinner out with wine, you can spend a few hundred dollars. Ball game tickets, easily spend a few hundred dollars. Golf, same or more. So most of the gifts that we recommend are like between $75 and $500. They're not like, you know, $25,000 Louis Vuitton bags. Because the goal is for it to be a thoughtful artifact, a thoughtful impression that has some lasting value, but that it doesn't exceed the normal things in business at a trade show, conference, dinners, all that kind of stuff. And so that's kind of our rule of thumb. So most of the things that we, when we execute gifting for companies, those are the same rules that we follow. And if somebody has a policy where they're like, we cannot accept a paper clip. Okay, then take a, the nicest piece of paper on the planet. Like our letterhead, we spend $9 on because it's a sheet of metal. And write the nicest note, take an hour, write a nice note to that person. And that's not going to get sent back. And oftentimes that, that'll have more impact than a $50 gift card somewhere anyway. So there are ways to either get around it or to play within the rules and still have impact. The simple fact is most people are lazy and they want to order things on Amazon or gift cards or whatever else or do the same thing that everybody else is doing. And so very rarely, I would say we get less than 1% of our gifts sent back to us, which is crazy because we send out tens and hundreds of thousands of gifts. And it's because we don't, we're not trying to bribe somebody. We personalize it with, with their name, not ours. And even if somebody has a gifting policy, we often see people who are like, you know what? I'm not going to be influenced by somebody sending me a chef knife. Like you're not sending people like, like I said, crazy Rolexes and goofy stuff where people are like, this is a red flag. And I feel uncomfortable even thinking about accepting it. So a lot of our gifts are more practical and simple. And I think people understand the purpose of them, the attention behind them. We'll get back to the conversation here in a quick second. But before we do that, I want to make sure you know about the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group. It shouldn't have surprised me, but I was so pleasantly elated by how warm and welcoming and wonderful all of you are towards each other. And I think I just forgot briefly that people who do brave, bold things on a daily basis, they aren't as scary as their feats of bravery might seem to me or to somebody else. You see, when you join the Bare Naked Bravery Facebook group, you're invited, not required, you're invited to share a picture or introduce us somehow to your unique bravery. These new member introductions are total day makers, and not just for me, for the other members of the group. I know this is true because I've seen it happen over and over again. It happens every time somebody new joins us. So please hop over to Facebook, search for Bare Naked Bravery and get ready for a great big internet hug of inspiration from inspired people doing really inspiring things in the world. I don't want you to miss out on any of it. You know, I'm thinking of like different kinds of creative entrepreneurs that I know listen to this podcast and know are probably listening to this episode specifically. For my musician friends who also do house concerts like I do, your house concert hosts are perfect examples of people who should be getting gifts from you. If anything, it should just be a postcard 
And one of the things I looked up doing because of reading your book is purchasing packages of like the wood postcards Mm -hmm. and putting some like brave themes on it. Yeah. And then getting some magnet stuff to put on the back of it so that my note is written on the back of the magnet and then the card can go on the refrigerator. Perfect. Right. So that's an example of how you, you can do, you can share your gratitude after the business exchange has been done. Yeah. You can still share your gratitude. It doesn't have to break your bank. No, but it can still be really personal and memorable. And I'm thinking of like some visual artist friends, you know, if you have a commission that you're doing, this would be a fantastic scenario too. like someone who just commissioned your work. You want to show they're showing you appreciation by saying, I love your work. Please make me a, make me a piece. And then you, now it's your turn to lob that gratitude back by saying, here's this beautiful piece. I went all out for it, but also here's a gift of a separate gift of gratitude for your appreciation for me and my work. And, And one of the best things I think in doing that is honoring their inner circle. When you, you know, an artist, when you're doing something for them, it's oftentimes there's one person who's driving that piece that that ordered it. it, you could be a guy or a gal, but if they're married, if you could do something cool to honor that other person that's smaller or their family, their kids, their inner circle, oh my God, you want to talk about a very small amount of money going super far and creating that memory. Because it's just, I mean, people are expecting when they, when they commission a piece from you, they're expecting something amazing. That's why they're paying you hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. But when you can show up and have done an extra 5%, that extra 5% is like, you'll get more response on that than the hundreds or thousands of dollars that they spent to commission a piece because Mm -hmm. they're expecting something awesome with that. The expectation is there. It's pretty Mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. But when you like, there's not an expectation for anything else. So that all of that, it's like going to a restaurant and spending a hundred dollars on a steak and then they show up with like a free cocktail at the end. Cocktail costs them next to nothing, but they're like, really? Like you found out this was my favorite port and you had it waiting for me. What would it cost the restaurant? Five bucks. But you're bragging to your friends on the $5 thing, not the $100 steak that you just bought. Right. And so I think that from a creative perspective, you're spot on. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it's doing the extra step or two steps or three steps. That's where things start to like, you get at like these raving fan advocates for you Mm -hmm. that go out of their way to open doors when they normally would just keep their mouth shut Mm -hmm. unless they were asked. So John, just so you know, my thesis for bravery is that it entails three main ingredients, improvisation, imagination, and vulnerability. Yeah. And each of those three categories have their own ingredients too, or like they're made of other ingredients. And this gift giving is a perfect example of this because in every set, every scenario that you have to be brave, you have to, there's a unique combination of those three ingredients, imagination, improvisation, and vulnerability. Yes. And, and the same thing happens with this gift giving too. You have to uniquely consider the constraints and the risks and the honesty and the, <laughs> and, and the, the defiant expectation uniquely for the scenario. So the person that's receiving the gift or where along the business life cycle they are. Are they before the transaction or after the transaction? And I love the fact that your group and what you do is founded in this or founded upon this value of generosity and gratitude. Yeah. And it's, and so kudos to you. Well done. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Well, I like the definition of bravery and it, there's no question that there is risk involved. You have to be vulnerable and, and it is imagination and it is, it, but here's the cool thing is people sometimes will say, well, John, you're cre- you're, this is for you, but I could never do this. And the simple fact is if a farm boy who grew up milking goats can do this, then anybody that wants to put the intention and the engagement level and on a consistent basis can become just as good a gift giver as I am. And I do it for a living. So I think I've thought about it every day for 17 years. 
And so when you do that, you become pretty good at it, but it's available to anybody. If they're willing to be brave and put themselves out there, like you're talking about and skin their knees and not, you know, like you saw in the book, I almost died during my engagement story because I, like I put myself out there and crashed and burned. Sometimes that's going to happen, but I don't, that I, I win way more often than I lose because I'm going to put myself out there and it usually works out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you, let's talk a little bit about speaking of the business life cycle before the transaction or the ex- money exchange happens. You mentioned you invested seven years of time or at least seven years of time into some of these relationships that you're talking about. Yep. Was it just seven years of rejection? I, I mean, I think rejection comes in different forms, but it was seven years of not getting the deal. No rep. <laughs> Seven years of no revenue coming in from those relationships. So there was stops and starts and, oh, yeah, we're interested. Oh, we got a delay. Oh, we want to do that. Oh, we don't have the budget. Like, so, I mean, at the end of the day, like, they were nice no's, which is what a lot of rejection is. Oh, we're, you know, like, everybody has excuses, you know, Mm -hmm. no matter what you're selling or what you're trying to engage people with. And so but it was seven years of me sending gifts and trying things and thinking I had the deal and it going nowhere. They not, they were talking to me. It wasn't like they were slamming the door in my face saying, John, we never, your firm sucks and we never want to talk to you again. Unless somebody signs on the dotted line, like in revenue exchanges hands, there is opportunities at times to get a test, you know, which is, can be a lot of a waste of time and rent, energy and money, but oftentimes we're willing to put our money where our mouth is and we'll say, well, you know, we'll comp the first five gifts and based upon the response of people, then you can determine whether you want to pay me or not. There's risk involved there, but oftentimes we believe in what we do enough that we'll put ourselves out there. And so that could be considered a rejection or it's a little sliver of a door being opened depending upon how you leverage that opportunity. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And I love the reminder that the more you ask, the more likely you'll get a yes. It's true. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, in the business with selling knives, which means you're, you're constantly getting rejected. What was the first time you got rejected? The first time I got rejected, I remember it really well. I was at I was 20 years old. I was at a friend's house, their parents' house from college. I knew the girl. And it was like one of those awkward no's. It was like very like they got all super quiet. And it was just like this horrible like, I'm like, uh, and I'm not, I'm a pleaser. Like I'm a, I'm a yes person. And it was just, you know, it was one of those ones where like I had had a bunch of yeses. I, I had, you know, I started off really well. And was just going gangbusters, was hustling. I was motivated. And this is with Catco? Yeah, this is yeah. with Catco. And it was in somebody's house and they said no. And I just walked out of there just feeling like dirty. Yeah, I just felt like this. It wasn't like they were rejecting the knife. They were rejecting me. But you soon, you soon learn. Like as things developed, I got to the point where I was, I, you know, we were closing nine out of every 10 people that we met with because we qualified who we were selling to. And we got really good at building relationships and like, handling objections and working through things. And I wouldn't change that for the world. Like that's, I think every business, every creative, every, I don't care if you're a pastor or you're a teacher, you're selling something. You're selling yourself, you're selling education, the importance of education, you're selling, you know, faith and relationships, like everybody's selling. And so being able to handle that kind of rejection and learn that at 20 years old was really like, to me, it's one of the, I think it's one of the best experiences anybody in college could possibly have. So did you guys, this is just curious. This is just me being curious. When you did Ketco, did you guys ever walk out going, how many rejections can I get today? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, not necessarily, you wouldn't do that like on the appointments themselves because you're, you're sitting down with people, but you would do that when you're, all of the appointments were set up by phone. Yeah. So you would, there were times where you have a contest, like how many no's can I, because you know, every time you, you know, like you're going to make 10 phone calls, you're going to get one appointment for every 10 phone calls you make and talking to somebody and getting no, like, so yeah, there, there were times that we would, we would have fun and focus on the, the no's cause that's just part of getting yeses. And that was, that's, I mean, that's one of the toughest parts is working a phone and calling people that you don't know 
now they're referred, you know, I know, you know, they get, they were given to you by their friend or family or whoever else. But even to this day, like that, it's a difficult, that phone is so heavy to pick up to your ear when you're like, I'm going to hear nine no's for every one. Yes. Like that's. Well, and that happens, you know, as a musician that happens when you're dealing with booking agents and venues and as a visual artist that happens with galleries too, you have to like say, Hey, do you want to hold my stuff for a couple months? And they're more likely to say, probably more likely to say no than yes. Yeah. But what are some ways that we can not necessarily think ahead, but what are some ways that we can preemptively guess at their response? So say, let's say like booking agents, for instance, or booking yeah. venues. Yeah. What are some good ways to kind of guess at what their response is going to be? Well, I think one of the best things to do is to, I mean, we would preempt the objections when we were, whether it was on the phone or whether it was in person, you'd say like, Hey, I know you're before they say they're busy. You say, Hey, I know you're really busy and you got kids and you're da da da. And so I'd love to meet with you at 7am or at, at 9pm. You know, I'm a college student. Da, da, da. Like I'm, you know, I got classes, but I'll, I'll meet you and, and make, and people love to meet with people that are, that are fun and make them laugh. And so I'm like, I'm a college student, but if you want to meet at 4 a.m. or if you want to meet on a Saturday at 6 a.m., like you basically handle the objection before they bring it up. And if you make 100 phone calls, you know the sorts of responses that people are going to have. Oh, uh, let me get back to you, or I got to talk to my manager, or I got to. There's probably 10 or 20 typical responses. And then figuring out ways, one, that you can have fun and make them laugh and preempt that objection and handle it by having a solution that kind of puts them into choose like, like one of our things was, you know, you give them two options. You don't say, can you, can I, can you meet with me at 5 PM? Cause that's a yes or no question. It's like, Hey, can you meet with me at five or would three o'clock be better? Now you're making a choice and people when they're giving two choices are likely to make a choice of one or the other. And so I think that walking people through kind of the psychology of how people make decisions and how, why they put up the rejection and, how to handle those objections ahead of time and how to make them laugh and make them like you within the first 30 seconds is all really key, whether you're in person or whether you're on the phone of getting way more yeses than no's. Or even an email. Cause I know a lot of venues, all that's done by cold emails. And as an artist, like my big trick is to end the, end the, end the email with this one question in bold, which is, are you able to host a concert on April 1st or April 5th? And that's like the, they know they can scan to the question. They don't have to read the mumbo jumbo of me going like, Hey, I'm super fancy Mm -hmm. and fun. They can just go directly to the bottom and go, okay, there's her question. Uh, No, or this date, the April 3rd would work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get a response. At the end of the day, like, like when you're, when you're emailing somebody, like, you want the, you just want to get them to respond. Yes, no, maybe I hate you. Like just something versus getting deleted. And oftentimes asking, you know, making the email, if you can personalize it with one line that shows that you actually understand the type of people that they book or understand something about them or reference, like do a little history. Like, Hey, I see you're a graduate of so-and-so like, Oh my, one of my best friends went there during that time. Like some point of contact that's commonality and then ask, like, you know, you give them two options and they can say yes or no to that. You're way more, 100% more likely to get a response to that than telling your whole life story. And they're just going to click delete because everybody's busy. Totally. So you're spot on. Totally. Okay. So before we end really quick, let's talk a little bit about what are some don't gives. Like what kind of gifts should you not give? We already so, mentioned one, which is something with your own logo. Yeah. We talk, we actually created a PDF that your listeners can download. If you go to yeah. gift, giftologybook.com, all one word, slash Emily, you can download the 10 worst gifts to avoid. So actual, like, don't give gift cards. You basically want to tell somebody that you're, that you're not thoughtful. Go buy them a gift card. It's like, oh, you weren't important enough to go pick out a gift, so I bought you a piece of plastic and now you have to spend money at this one place. Like most unthoughtful thing on the planet. I don't like food or consumables of any sort. 
for a number of reasons. One is you're looking for a cost per impression that's high or that's low. And so when you give a gift and they still have it 10 years later and they're thinking about you, the, the cost per impression, like when you do advertising, you're thinking about like how many times is that person going to see the ad or whatever else? Like when you give a gift that's well thought out, that lasts, that's great. But if food lasts maybe five minutes, so maybe you only spent $30 on it, but if they only think about you for five minutes, that's, that's not a real good return on investment. So we don't recommend food. It can also offend people. Everybody's gluten intolerant and on special diets and you have alcoholics. Like food has so many risks involved and so little upside, it's just not worth touching. If at all possible, it has to not only be personalized with their name, you may not be able to personalize every single gift over the moon, but at least it has their name on it, spouse's name, and it has to have a handwritten note. So it's a gift. It's not a delivery from Amazon. Like it's a gift. And a gift has a note. It needs to be handwritten. I don't care if your handwriting sucks. It's still better than some typed out little message on a piece of paper that makes it look like it was automated. People deal with people. Like even in 2017, they want relationships. I would also say that gifts that include the spouse and significant others, huge brownie points, huge upside. Because oftentimes the person you're giving a gift to is used to getting nice dinners and catered to because they're the decision maker. They're the executive. And their spouse oftentimes is like left hanging out to dry, doesn't get any of that sort of thing. And so including the significant other is massive. Assistant, if they have an assistant, I treat them like gold. I have three assistants. If somebody wants to get to me, they treat my team with dignity and, and like not, not like a pawn or a gatekeeper. And then I, one of the other things I would say is that if you can't afford a certain category of gift at a world-class level, so sometimes people are like, hey, I want to give a watch. And I'm like, okay, tell me about the people you're giving the watches to. Like, oh, they're business executives. I'm like, what kind of watch do you think they wear? Oh, they wear like a Breitling or a Rolex. Or, I'm like, okay, so you're going to give them a fossil and you think it's a really nice fossil watch and it's $100, do you really think they're going to take their Rolex off and put the fossil on? I'm like, they're like, no. I'm like, then give a gift at a different category. Like somebody, I used to make fun of mugs. Somebody that was this like ceramic mug maker made me like a $200 mug, carved my whole life story into this mug. It's like one of my most prized gifts because it's the best mug that I've ever seen. It is unbelievable. And people are like, really a mug? And I'm like, I drink coffee or tea every day and most of the planet does too. So it's useful, it's super personal and it's the best on the planet in that little category. And so I think whatever you can give, make sure that it's best in class and whatever the category is for that person. Don't give some trinket or whatever else. Like you might think it's cool, but if the other person's just gonna throw it in the landfill, like that's not, you wanna stay green, don't give junk. Like mm -hmm. people are gonna throw away. So that's my- I love it. Mini rant. I love it. I love it. So they can, we can all download that PDF by going to giftologybook.com forward slash Emily. Yes. Um, and, and that should be live uh, within the next couple hours. It's, sure. uh, it, yeah, it should be live. In that. Yep. Great. Great. Well, John, I'm, this has been so much fun. I agree. Thank you. It's, uh, it's fun when the other person has read the book and is, is and has not only read it, but has actually gone out and I'm super oh. impressed that you went and tested out the, the concepts. People are like, oh yeah, it's a really great concept. I'm like, so you know, what have you done with it? They're like, well, I'm thinking differently. I'm like, don't give me that like thinking differently. Like go do differently. Like, yep. so like, I, well, I, I will say this, a lot of my, a lot of my trial and error stuff comes from me just being naturally a devil's advocate. So <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Test the, I mean, they don't work a, a thousand percent of the time, but they work most of the time. Like there, totally. there's, there's always anomalies. People are like, Oh, I did this gift the one time it didn't work. I'm like, really one time that's your test is, mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, go do it a hundred times and come back to me and 95 out of a hundred, you're going to be like, all right, John, you're right. Like I, this is unbelievable. But the fact that you went and did it is super impressive. So you guys, you should try something this week. Your brave takeaways this week are to go to giftologybook.com forward slash Emily, get that PDF of the top gifts to not give. And the second thing is to figure out one person and one small gift that can just be like, a handwritten note and give it away. Share some gratitude, 
And I think you'll see that it, it works most of the time, just like John said. So thank you again, John, for joining us. I really, really am so glad to have had you on the show. Thanks, Emily, for having me. This has been awesome. So that's our show this week. Thank you for listening. Again, we have put all of the links in the show notes for today's episode, including a link to the download that John mentioned earlier. Just go to barenakedbravery.com for all of that. You can also get a download of the awesome adult coloring book with a bunch of beautiful artists and all of their work so that next time when you listen to the episode, you can color along while you're listening, which is pretty cool. That is available for free to download. You just go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash color. And it's the U.S. spelling of color, C-O-L-O-R. So sorry, you guys. Anyways, if you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it for you, then please give us a review and rate the show in your iTunes desktop app or on your podcast app on your phone. It doesn't have to be iTunes. You can leave a review in other places too. It really does help us out a lot more than it is a hassle for you. So just go ahead and do it. It's fun. And the reason why I'm asking all of this is because all the bravery that is displayed in today's episode and also in previous episodes, it deserves to be spread as far and as wide as possible. And who knows, one of your friends might really need to listen to someone else's version of bravery because they're going through it right now too. So go ahead and share. You are a part of all of this. If you are digging the music in today's episode, that is because it's brought to you by my friends at Music Box Licensing, a premier creative music agency dedicated to finding and crafting unique soundtracks. To find out more about all the artists and musicians and other sponsors of the show, go to barenakedbravery.com forward slash sponsors. So sponsors for sponsors and color for coloring books. (laughs) <laughs> I'm looking forward to being with you next week. We have some really great things in store for you. Until then, I have one message for you, other than the spelling for color in U.S. and British. The message is this. <laughs> be yourself. Be vulnerable. Be brave. Because the world needs more of your bare naked bravery. Right